For centuries, indigenous communities have been forced to leave their land, the place they called home as American settlers moved west. While some people were pushed about, forced onto lands that were barren and difficult to make a living on, the Osage Indians were a rare success story having found oil-rich lands in Oklahoma. But their good fortune came with unforeseen consequences. In the early 1900s, dozens of Osage Indians turned up dead, killed by a variety of means, though it was often difficult for families to prove that their loved ones had been targeted. Eventually, the federal government intervened, leading to the arrest of two men for only a handful of the murders. It was one of the first times the FBI, then known as the Bureau of Investigation, became involved in such matters, making it one of the more notable cases of FBI history. The Osage were a unique tribe because they owned the land they lived on, which was located in a mountainous area of Oklahoma. As David Grant explained in his book Killers of the Flower Moon, Osage chief Wai Tanga chose the area because he knew it wasn't land that settlers would want. It was rocky and infertile, meaning farming would be difficult. They also had the upper hand in their negotiations, as Oklahoma was nearing statehood, and legislators were desperate to finalize their deal with the Osage. For this reason, they were able to slip into their treaty for allotment, a very curious provision at the time which essentially said, that they will maintain the subsurface mineral rights to their land. Grant explained in an interview with NPR, The Allotment Act was finalized in 1906, and Oklahoma became a state the following year. By then, the Osage had found oil under the land, and to obtain that oil, prospectors had to pay the Osage for leases, and also royalties on revenues. As prospectors continued to drill for oil over the years, the Osage would receive payments which grew substantial. In 1923, Grand Road, the tribe took in more than $30 million, the equivalent today of more than $400 million. More interesting was the fact that the Osage people each received a head right, which was essentially a share in the tribe's mineral trust. But to keep the mineral trust under tribal control, no one could buy or sell head rights. These could only be inherited. However, this would make the Osage the target of those seeking to strike rich in the years to come. The investigation into the killings began primarily due to the death of an Osage woman called Anna Brown, a 36-year-old who was found shot dead execution style a week after she went missing on May 21, 1921. The same day, Osage man Charles Whitehorn was found dead. Then weeks later, Anna's mother died. Lizzie died in July 1921 after falling ill. Evidence later surfaced that she had been poisoned. Members of Anna's family continued to die under mysterious circumstances. Anna's sister Rita Smith's house had been bombed, killing her and her white servant Nettie Brookshire in March 1923. Rita's husband Bill Smith survived the blast, telling those who pulled him out of the rubble that they got Rita and now it looks like they got him. Bill succumbed to his injuries four days later. Anna and her husband were only a handful of the Osage to be killed during a time known as the Reign of Terror, and dozens of others were found dead by either gunshot wounds or illness, later believed to be caused by poisoning. And it was often difficult for anyone to be held accountable, as the police force was lacking. There was a great deal of lawlessness, and because of that, justice was often privatized, that if you had money and resources, you had to turn to private investigators. Multiply private investigators and other secret seeking justice for the Osage Indians attempted to get the federal government involved, but they were also killed. One man named Vaughan was thrown off a train while another Barney McBride was found beaten to death in Washington DC. With the death toll at that point well over 20, the Bureau of Investigation then headed by a young J. Edgar Hoover had to get involved. They also had jurisdiction over American Indian reservations, which is why they got jurisdiction over this case, and why it became one of their first major homicide investigations. Hoover sent former Texas Ranger Tom White to investigate the killings, and he recruited other men who would go undercover in the community, as White understood that this was a dangerous operation that required the utmost secrecy. Included among the group of ragtag agents were a former New Mexico sheriff, a former Texas Ranger, a former insurance salesman turned undercover operative, as well as agents John Berger and Frank Smith. 
They also negotiated a deal with outlaw Kelsey Morrison, who agreed to work as an undercover informant in exchange for an assault charge being dropped. Notably, White also brought in John Wren, a youth Indian man who previously served as a spy in the Mexican Revolution. He's believed to be one of the first indigenous agents in the FBI. It didn't take long for the man to realize that this region of Oklahoma was rife with corruption and intrigue. The Osage were frequently taken advantage of by the people they brought into their own homes and the guardians who were tasked with overseeing their finances. Per the Allotment Act, Native Americans were deemed too incompetent to handle their own money, so the Office of Indian Affairs appointed guardians to oversee their finances. Incompetency was determined by an Osage racial weakness or the quantum of Indian blood in the property holder, so full-blooded Indians were often granted guardians while those of mixed race were not. Anna Brown's sister, Molly Burkhardt, who was full-blooded, learned through White's investigation that her husband and guardian, Ernest Burkhardt, was part of the plot to kill her family. She had two children with him and she learned that he was one of the many willing executioners and she had to sit through the trials and listen to the evidence presented and learn the secrets of her husband, that the secrets of this murder were right inside her house. Her husband Ernest and his uncle William Hill, a wealthy cattle rancher, were by Molly Burkhardt's as she grieved for her sisters and mother. William even hired a private detective and offered a reward in exchange for information leading to the arrest of the killers. But White and his investigators noticed that the man stood to earn a large fortune in the event of Molly's dead. In Killers of the Flower Moon, Gran explained that when Anna died, her head right passed on to her mother Lizzie, whose head right would be passed on to Rita and Anna in the event of her dead. When Rita died, her head right then went to Anna. Anna's marriage to Ernest, who was also her guardian, meant that he oversaw her large fortune, and if she died, he'd stand to inherit everything. Though White and his men struggled to get anyone in the Osage community to speak out against Hill, everyone feared they too would face retribution. The private detective purportedly hired by Hill to investigate Anna's dead told them that he was actually hired to craft alibis for Ernest, William, and William's nephew Brian Burkhardt who had driven Anna home the night of her murder. Eventually, after months of undercover work, White and his men found a witness who had not yet died under mysterious circumstances. Bert Lawson, who claimed to have planted the bomb under the Smith home, he said that Hill and Ernest Burkhardt were in on the scheme to kill the family. It was enough to get an arrest warrant for both men, who immediately denied any wrongdoing. Though the men were in custody and kept separate from each other, they could only be held for so long before White had to let them go. Desperate to make Ernest break, White turned to outlaw Blackie Thompson, a part Cherokee criminal who was in custody for a separate murder. He had a strong dislike of Hill and Ernest, so he agreed to share what he knew of the crimes, even agreeing to confront Ernest in the interrogation room. Ernest, now aware that he was caught, shared every detail of his and Hill's plan, naming John Ramsey as the shooter in the death of Henry Roan who was found shot to death in his car. He also identified Anna Brown's murderer, Kelsey Morrison, the same man working for White and his agents. After White learned that Ernest was one of the many men behind the murders, he instructed officers to take Molly Burkhardt, who was in poor health, to a local hospital believing that she may be poisoned. When she was removed from the control control of Burkhardt and Hill, she immediately regained health. Still, Molly refused to believe that Ernest was involved in the murders. My husband is a good man, a kind man. He wouldn't have done anything like that, and he wouldn't hurt anyone else, and he wouldn't ever hurt me, she said. When it came time for the trial in the Smith explosion, Ernest was ready to testify for the prosecution, until he had a sidebar with Hill's defense team which was then hired to represent him. The trial seemed destined to end with Hill walking free, but then in June 1926 Ernest once again changed his mind. A week prior, Ernest and Molly's youngest daughter, little Anna, had died after falling ill. She was four years old. Ernest eventually told his defense lawyer, according to Killers of the Flower Moon, I'm sick and tired of all this. I want to admit exactly what I did. 
he entered a guilty plea to the murder of Rita and Bill Smith, as well as their housekeeper. Ernest testified in Hill and Ramsey's trial for the murder of Henry Roan, which ended in a man's conviction. Likewise, Morrison was found guilty of Anna Brown's murder. However, none of the men were given the death penalty. The jury instead recommended a life sentence for all three men. Molly Burkhardt divorced Ernest Burkhardt following Anna Brown's murder trial, in which he detailed every sordid detail of their plans. She laid Later married John Cobb in 1928 and three years later she'd be declared competent. At the age of 44 she was released from the garden system. Following the trial, William Hill as well as John Ramsey were sent to Leavenworth Prison in Kansas, where Special Agent Tom White was now working as a prison warden. Hill was later paroled in 1947 but was forbidden from returning to Osage. He died in an Arizona nursing home in 1962. As previously mentioned, in 1926, White turned his FBI badge in exchange for a more stable job. Case in point, he ended up being taken hostage by a group of outlaws who escaped the prison in 1931. During the escape, an inmate went to shoot White in the face, but the bullet shattered in White's arms and chest when he shielded his face. He was left bloodied and seriously injured, but miraculously survived after several days in the hospital. He died of a stroke at the age of 19 in October 1970. Ernest Burkhardt was released from prison on parole in 1937. The same year Molly Burkhardt died at the age of 50. However, he robbed an Osage home and was sent back to prison later being released in 1959. He too was forbidden from returning to Osage, but he applied for a pardon which was granted in 1962, allowing him to return to the reservation, where he reunited with his son Cowboy and daughter Elizabeth. Cowboy's daughter Margie told Gran that her father had a difficult relationship with Ernest for obvious reasons. I think part of him longed for a father, but he knew what his father has done. He called them old dynamite. Ernest Burkhardt died in 1986. The Osage Indians continued to receive their head rights, though it is not enough to make a living. Today, approximately 26% of all head rights are owned by non-Osage individuals, churches, universities and other non-Osage institutions who can freely grant such interests to any person or entity the non-Osage chooses. The Osage Minerals Council is currently seeking federal legislation to permit non-Osages who own a head right interest in the Osage Mineral Estate to gift or sell those head right interests back to the Osage Minerals Council, the Osage Nation or Osage individuals. Though the Osage population was decimated in the early 1900s, their website reads, The Osage Nation is thriving in our reservation in Northeast Oklahoma, a people of strength, hope, and passion, honoring the stories of the past and building the world of the future. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to click that like button. Also don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about our latest videos.